We've had scripture alone. We've had grace alone. Today we look at faith alone. Let me get you to do what we did last week by turning to the text, our primary scripture we're going to look at this morning. Today it's going to be in the book of Galatians, uh, I, chapter 2, chapter 3, I'm not sure. I'll flip a coin here in a few moments. But anyway, uh, Galatians, actually we'll look in both chapters. Uh, and you just hold your spot there just as we did last week. We'll get there in a little bit. It's going to take a few minutes. So don't think we're going to dive right in as we uh, normally do here. A little bit different in these messages. I'm trying to sort of build in some history here and help you really grasp what this this whole thing of alone is all about. You, you know, I mentioned that we last week we were looking at grace alone and and I, I think if I had to define that, although we tried to define it last week, I, I just felt like I didn't do a great job. So I want to just give you one last statement about that as we now move to faith alone. I would say grace alone. What do I mean by that? It's simply why we are drawn or able to know God. To me, that's grace. It's, it's how we are drawn and it is how we are able to. To, to, to know God. I, I would just put grace in, in sort of that encapsulation. And it's much more than that. Again, uh, if you were not here last week, I strongly encourage you to go back and, and uh, go to our website. And you can just check out what we shared last week. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who can present greater biblical truth than I am that have dealt with this issue for years. But at least it will let you know where we are and, and where we feel like God is leading us as a, a body of believers. Whether it's here on Sunday morning we call Riverside or the Trailhead which meets on Wednesday night. But the, the, the key verse for those reformers and certainly for Martin Luther that I've shared each Sunday so far and each Wednesday at the trailhead. The key verse was that verse out of Romans chapter 1 and it's verse 17. It's going to be on the screen so you can look at this one more time. Uh, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. That rocked Martin Luther's world. And then he went on to read, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. It was based on that life-altering power, that, that verse and that concept and others that, that the Reformation was literally birth. If you were to single out one primary verse, I would say that would be the verse. Certainly it was true in Martin Luther's life. And justification by faith became the rallying cry of the Reformation. Now why am I saying that? Well, what I'm trying to say is this, that at the center of the Reformation, at the center of this breakup that had, had so held people down, this religiosity that had so consumed the culture with their tradi- traditions and their preferences and their controlling of the, the spiritual mind of men and women that had so enslaved humanity for years and years and years, this very verse was the key that really was the set off the powder keg that brought us the freedom that we enjoy today. That it literally is that we are justified by faith and nothing else. That, that's significant, folks. And I, I just got to tell you, in, in my heart of hearts, being a pastor now for, goodness, about 39 years, I, I'm just telling you that I believe this is still a stronghold that the enemy has over people of God. I believe it still is a great battleground for maybe even a lot of people who've been in church most of their lives. This is, this is a, a battlefield of war where we, we fight every day. And I think sometimes the battle is so subtle that we're not even aware that we've been duped by the enemy on this very principle. And I hope to explain those comments here in just a few moments. John Calvin said, this justification by faith, here's his quote, the main, it was the main hinge on which religion turns. One of the great reformers was John Calvin, and it was the hinge on which religion turns. How do we define, well, that big word first, justification? What does that mean? Well, I would say that for me, the best definition is we are declared righteous. There's the definition I would give you. Justification, as simply as I know how to put it, but as, as, as profoundly as I know how to put it, we are declared righteous. Now, there, there are some, and it's, it's a very cute and quaint saying, who will say, well, you know, justification means ju- 
just as if I never sinned. And I would say, you know, there are some components to that that most of us have used throughout history that are true, but it really is not sufficient as a definition. In fact, there are some parts of that that just simply aren't true because it does not cover all that the gospel brings to us. It does not really share where we are in Christ. Because just as if I had never sinned sort of represents a blotting out, a taking away. And we know that that is there. But folks, we have also been forgiven. And, and we need to be very careful that we don't forget that we've been forgiven. If you are right with God, if you have a place in heaven waiting for you right now, if you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and you've been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. You have come to Christ in your sin and He has chosen by His grace to forgive you, to cleanse you of that sin. And so really to say, just as if I had never sinned, again, there's some parts of that that are certainly true but insufficient in my, as I said last week, humble but accurate opinion, right? And so think about that. You are declared righteous. That is much more than just saying, well, God just sort of forgot about it, e even though he does. Don't forget the price of your forgiveness. Don't forget what we celebrate this week. We call it Good Friday. It was good for everybody except Jesus, right? It was not good for Jesus. Good, yes, in that he followed through on the will of the Father and he being the Father himself, God incarnate in flesh. But listen, it was not a good day for Jesus. But he provided that so you and I could have this justification. We could be declared righteous. Uh, the only verse in the Bible that Charlie knows is Romans 8 verse 1. Charlie, you want to say it out loud? Oh, come on. You know that verse. How about I help you? He said it, and he got it right. Let me just look at it on the screen. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Charlie needs to be reminded of that verse an awful lot. You know, he just really needs to be reminded of it. And it's true. It's true. What a great, great, great verse. That's what being declared just or being justified, that's what it means. There is how much more condemnation? None. 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 Does, does that mean we're never a goober again? Well, of, of course not. We still are gooberized from time to time, right? We still do gooberish things, right? From time to time. See, it doesn't matter where you are. You know what I mean by that, right? You get that. That just translates in all cultures. Well, the reality is, yes, we, we still wrestle with our sin. But get this. Positionally, the moment we give our hearts, our lives to Christ, positionally, we are seated and secured in the heavenlies forever. Amen. Ever. It's a done deal. So, so I, I've got this little seat. I'm there. I, I am there. Now, we talk about, I, I, I like to put these two together always. We, talked about, we talk about how that, that practically we're working that out daily. Practically, we're looking more like Christ. At least that's the goal. As we walk with Him, we learn His heart. We learn His will. And we push back against the confirming principles of this world. Why? Because the Bible says that. It says, be not conformed to this world. And that also means don't be conformed to your family. Don't be conformed to your small group's traditions. Don't be conformed to the religion that you've always known. But by the renewing of your mind, every day, we become more like Christ. We call that sanctification. So justification means positionally, I am seated with Christ. It is done. Say done. 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 Look at your neighbor and say done. done. It's true. And we need to learn to rest in that great truth and never think that we have anything to do with our justification before God. I'm just going to tell you, if you have an authentic salvation, it never had anything to do with you. Oh, listen, yes, you're, you're the point of that salvation. But it has always been because of Christ. And it's sustained because of Christ. 
Not anything that you do. The importance of that. I, I, don't, I don't know how I can overstate this. So let me give you something else here. Only the righteous can have and enjoy a relationship with God. Let me say it again. Only the righteous can have and enjoy a relationship with God. I promise we're going to get to Galatians. I told you, okay? But only the righteous. But it's not our righteousness. It is the righteousness of God. When we are justified by faith, we are declared immediately, instantaneously righteous before God. And I'll tell you, I don't want to steal the thunder from next week, but that's what separates us from all the other world religions and religious leaders of the world. Only, only through Christ. Historically, the church has taken three positions on how we get to that place of righteousness. Let me remind you of them. Most of you already know these. The church has taught that we could be, number one, found righteous. Found righteous. That really is one of the big battles that the reformers fought. Because the church was teaching that we could be found righteous. In fact, that is still very popular in religious circles. That there is somehow, and uh, Pelagianism is probably one of the best known philosophical thoughts that are attached to that because they're named after its founder. And they really, really taught that you could live in such a way that, that you could live a life in such a way that on judgment day, when you ultimately stood before God, that you, you would have finally arrived at a place where you could be found righteous. That's not what the Bible teaches. We are made righteous, justified by what? Faith. The second thing, and is still very prominent today, and, and you know, we don't take shots at other groups and organizations because, because we look in the mirror every once in a while and we see how messed up we are. So I'm not going to do that, all right? But as a matter of, of fact, I'm going to say, one of the big battles of the, the Reformation was to do with the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church still holds to this today. A second way that you could be justified or made is that you be made righteous. So we've got found righteous, that you know somehow you would maneuver through this life and you would get there, and, 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 and you'd be found righteous on Judgment Day. Well, the Bible refutes that over and over and over and over because we're sinners and we're not holy, and it just it can't happen. Our best is like filthy rags. But this concept of being made righteous, is, it, it implies a process which makes you righteous. Stay with me on this. Because here's where a lot of you in this room battle daily. You somehow think, even though intellectually you know that you are justified by faith, there is something in your mind that the enemy has placed there and you are still trying to prove that you are righteous with God. You're still in that battle. And again, the Catholic Church has, has really taken that. Now, by the way, let me just say this. For those of you that think that the Catholic Church does not believe in grace, no, they absolutely do. And they believe that grace actually allows them to get to this place. So don't, it's not like everything that another group says is, is always wrong. There, there's, there's a mixture here. And, and again, I, I would say to you in fairness that we have our own issues I mean, you do. I don't, of course, but you do, right? I mean, you. For those of you who don't know me, please know that I'm kidding. I mean, that's just, I'm joking, okay? It's just my way of softening the blow a little bit, all right? I, I really, please hear me. I, trust me, talk to my wife. You'll know very quickly that I. Um, but it, it's a mixture of grace and works. And as I said last week, any addition to God's formula taints the formula and then makes our salvation invalid. In other words, it's not real. So it must be justification by faith, period. I mean, like, 
big period, exclamation point, period, and exclamation point again. And we have to battle trying to make ourselves righteous. And that's all the things that we saw introduced that the reformers like Martin Luther were fighting. Even when it got down to the indulgences and, and penance and confirmation and all those things that are anti-biblical, that are extra-biblical, if you will. You don't find those things in Scripture. It's justification by faith. And the third one is the one that we're presenting today, and it's declared righteous. We are declared righteous apart from anything we could offer. We are declared righteous by Christ. What does it mean? It means God credits us with the righteousness of Jesus himself. God credits us with the righteousness of Jesus himself. Do you see the difference in those three? Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody over here see the difference in those three? Yeah? Yeah, you got it? Okay, good. A couple more. Massive difference. And by the way, it's the difference between an eternity with God and eternity separated from God. We must receive this declared righteousness. How? We've talked a lot about the word justification, and that's really what I'm kind of uh, unpacking here for you this morning. But let's go to that second other big word, righteousness by, what was the word? Faith. Faith. What is faith? The root word there, pistuo, it's, it's literally, and it's active. Faith is always active. Don't want you to miss this. And it's seen here, though, as resting or confidence in. Uh, probably the, the, the most simple and, and widely used illustration of faith is, and, and I'll just use this big heavy speaker here. I, I look at that speaker and, and I say that I believe it could support me if I put my weight on it. And, and, I, and I can tell you all about the workings of this speaker. I can get over here and pick up and tell you it probably weighs about, oh, that's probably about 500 pounds, I'd say, something like that. I could tell you that. I could use my right arm, but it'd be, you know, I don't need it. Um, so, you know, I could say, you know, I could tell you all this stuff, and we could talk about the, make, but the, the truth is, I, I don't have real faith in the fact that it'll hold me up until I do this. Right? And so I am now resting. I've put my total confidence, and you can say, well, it's six inches off the floor. You're not going to hurt yourself if you fall, right? That's not the point. I know how some of you think, okay? You kind of messed up. I get it. So let, let, stay with me here. Stay with me. The deal is, is now I put my confidence and I'm resting. And look, now totally, right? Can't do that with some issues I'm having right now. But anyway, so I'm totally resting in, in this, or, or have confidence in that. So that's what we do. When we exhibit faith, I'm trusting in, right now, this speaker and nothing else. Okay, it's on the platform. It's, you know, I, stay with me. Now, when you, when you consider that, have you been declared righteous? And are you trusting? Do you have faith in the justification by faith and faith alone? Are you saying, I'm laying aside everything else and my full confidence is in Christ Jesus and what he's done? Now, friends, listen, it's real easy in this room to go, well, yeah, I think so. Oh, not good enough. No. Because there is this battle that we have already referenced here. So it's the primary truth that, again, separates, I believe, Christianity from all other faith systems. Martin Luther, and there that is on the screen, so you can just look at it. But Martin Luther said this. He, he called this the summary of all Christian doctrine. The summary of all Christian doctrine. Justification by faith. The fact that our relationship with God has no merit, no merit in any work we have or ever can do distinguishes us, again, from all other Christian groups. Zero merit. Zero merit. My relationship with God has no merit in any work that I can do. Let me say it again another way. We bring nothing to the negotiating table but the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Nothing to the negotiating table but the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 2 beginning with verse 15. 
Galatians chapter 2, beginning with verse 15. You there? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified, but if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. One of the primary things that Paul is dealing with in this letter that he wrote to the church, the body of believers at Galatia, he was battling a philosophy that a group that became known as the Judaizers were trying to make very prominent. And the Judaizers were saying, hey look, we understand it's by grace. We understand it's by faith. They'd say, yep, yep, it sure is. Absolutely. But then they would go on and they'd say, but you also need to... And then they would fill in the blank. And most often what they would do is they would go back to that Judaistic system. They would go back to the law and they'd say, Hey, we're glad that you have faith in Christ, but you also need to do this. And you also need to do this. And you also need to do this. That's exactly what Paul is talking about here in those verses that we just read. He's saying, listen, we the Jewish people, look, we had access to the law. We had access to the prophets. We had access to these amazing miracles and the covenants of God. And it gave them, it gave them a moral compass to live by. But it could in no way ever justify them. Now how does that connect to us in this room? A lot of you have been in church a long time. Some of you have never said it, but I'm convinced your mom, after nine months, came to church on a Sunday, walked right up to the altar, and pfft, just right there, had you on the altar. And I mean, you were literally just birthed right there in church. And you probably, I mean, just by the way you act sometimes, right, you have never gone outside of this building. Maybe never outside of this room. Now, no, smile, okay? Stay with me. Smile. You know, that's your experience. And I'm telling you, you know the history of the church, and you know every book in the Bible, and you can quote probably most of it by memory, and you, are, you, just, you know it all and everything. Can I tell you, not one bit of that justifies you before God. In fact, related to your relationship with God in justification, it is absolutely worthless. In fact, I might add, it may even be more detrimental to you than it is positive. Because you may have forgotten the amazing grace that has been offered you. You know, I, I, I kind of feel like I grew up in that environment in, in a sense. I, I kind of grew up during that time, you know, I was uh, in, in high school there in the, the, um, the late 70s. And, and, uh, and I remember when music was changing in the church. And, and man, I was, you know, I had hair halfway down to my back. And I was kind of living in rebellion. And all of a sudden, I started listening to some music that was talking about Jesus that I actually could stomach. Just telling you the truth. I mean, there were some of those wild groups. I mean, they were heretics, God, like the Imperials. I mean, these guys were just, they, they were just radical. And you know what? I, I remember I started singing, and because I, I was a musician, and I started singing a little bit and started doing some worship. And I, I remember I sang a song by the Imperials in a church. And, and the pastor came to me and said, you ever do that again, you, you're, you'll never be back in this church. Because you see, there were the Jews who separated sacred and secular. And they thought if it did not sound like their traditions and what they had known, then it was blasphemous, it was heretical, it couldn't be of God. 
Now, folks, I'm, I'm going way back to the 70s, so don't, you don't dare think I would imply that we think like that today. Now, I'm just picking on one thing. Pr- praise the Lord. I think, by and large, we've slain that monster, and, and we're, we're just glorifying God, by and large. But uh, you could take anything in the Christian realm, and you could apply it that way. There was this sacred and, and the secular. And don't misunderstand me. I know there are some things that are sacred. But what makes it sacred is that it is given to God for His glory. It, it's not about a particular suit you wear to church. I saw yesterday where the double-breasted suits are coming back, guys. Did you see that? Right? I think, well, <laughs> that would be real mean for me to say that. I was going to talk about how much cloth some of the guys are going to demand, but I won't do that. But the double-breasted suits are coming back. So you guys that have kept them all these years, you're good to go, all right? You're ready. <laughs> Mark, you look down. You don't have one in your closet, do you? Okay, you still... Okay. <laughs> you, but you know, it's, I, I can remember, you know, there was a time when we'd go to our denominational conference every year. And I mean, it was back in the years where there'd be 45, 50,000 people there at our convention. And, and man, they all had the same polyester sport coat on. Every one of them. And they were all overweight. They never taught about the body being the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'll... Yeah, you know, we pick and choose our sin, don't we? Anyway, I hope you kind of get what I'm saying. Listen, Martin Luther wrestled with this himself. That's where Martin Luther found himself. He wrestled with his sin and his salvation for years. In fact, his vicar, which was uh, Stoppitz, I believe was his name, his vicar, his, his overhead overseer there, he would go to him and confess his sin every day. And then it got to where Martin Luther was so afraid because he didn't yet understand justification by faith. He thought it was about his merit, his works, and he was so afraid that if he were to die, that he would be damned to an eternity in hell, that he would go multiple times during the day and he'd confess his sins. And then he'd go back and he'd lay in his bed at night and he'd begin to think about not just the sins of commission but he'd begin to think about the sins of omission the things that things that he had not even done that he knew that God wanted him to do and he'd get up in the middle of the night and he'd go wake up his vicar and he'd say I've got to confess these more things and finally it got so crazy that, his, that Stoppitz looked at him and he said listen if you're going to confess all the time why don't you go do something worthy of confessing why don't you go kill your parents have an adulterous relationship then come back and we've got something we can talk about You see how insane that pattern is? And maybe you're not confessing. By the way, don't take shots at Martin Luther in that time. Maybe we should consider our spiritual situation a little more often, even today. Sometimes we don't even think about, is our relationship, our walk with Christ where it needs to be? Oh, yes, I'm justified by faith, but am I walking in proper fellowship with Him? Or is there sin in my life that I'm allowing to push God's presence? Am I far away from God or am I near to God in these moments? But God kept working in His life. And then verses like we've already shared radically changed Him. Let me give you this and I'm going to sprint toward the end. The righteousness by which I am saved is not mine. The righteousness by which I am saved is not mine. It is the declared righteousness of Christ. You know, here in Colorado, we've heard a lot about uh, fire dangers here with it being so warm and, and dry. And, you know, Sherry and I lived in Oklahoma City for six years and you know, they were always having fires there. Oklahoma has everything. Tornadoes, fires, had a hurricane form over the city while we were there. No, it really did. It's like the only time in history, but it, it, actually it was a reformation of a hurricane. But yeah, and everybody said it was because I was there. So they, they threw Jonah off the boat, um, so to speak. They're still having crazy weather. You know, one of the things that I learned about fire mitigation was, and I've learned it here, you know, you clear out things around your house that could be combustible, that if a fire does come, right, you've heard this, that, that you know, it, it would have no fuel 
to generate and ultimately consume your home. That's a great principle they tell you if you live, you know, up in the hills or anywhere. And, and uh, in Oklahoma, what they would do in extreme situations because of the wind that's blowing there, you know, it's about 75 miles an hour every day. And so as the wind would blow across the plains, you've heard the song, right? Oh, Oklahoma. Yeah, that's it. And it's true. And, and so what they would do often if there was imminent danger with a fire, they actually would start up against the house and start a fire and let that, Jerry, you know about this? And that, that fire would burn away from your house so that when the fire got to your home, it would have nothing that it could consume. Now listen, friends, that's what declared righteousness looks like. As the judgment of God comes, listen, Christ has already consumed all that which could be taken away. You're listening? And so that judgment fire of God, when it approaches you, it has nothing to which it can attach itself and consume. Why? Because you are positionally in Christ. And Romans chapter 6 tells us that literally, when Christ died, you died. As Christ was raised, you were raised. And so when God looks at us, He sees, literally, you are dead in Christ Jesus. There is nothing to consume. There is nothing left but the righteousness of God. And it cannot harm you. That's declared righteousness. Is that not beautiful? Right. Okay. Thank you, Mina. I appreciate that, buddy. Hey, let me, let me put this way. For those of you that married up, here's the deal. Maybe you married a wealthy woman. Right? Or not? Maybe you did. Can I tell you? If the lady's wealthy and you marry her, you're both wealthy. Is that not good? My dad always said, son, find a young one and a rich one. I found one younger than me. She's one of 13 kids. That's where it ended. But that's what happens in Christ. When you are identified with Jesus Christ, you are declared righteous. You are wealthy. Why? Because He's wealthy. Amen. You're righteous. Why? Because He's righteous. Amen. It's righteousness by faith. I'm out of time. So i got to sprint very, very, very fast. Galatians 3. Let me read these verses. We cannot miss these. Galatians 3, beginning with verse 1. You foolish Galatians... Who has bewitched you? Remember the Judaizers? Who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? And you could tell Paul's a preacher because he says, this is the only thing I want to know. And then he asks four things. Okay? It's kind of like I'm, I'm sprinting to the end. <laughs> sure I am. Verse 2. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? A third question. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? A fourth question, verse 4. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Verse 6, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore be sure that it, is those, that it is those who are of faith, who are sons of Abraham. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. We're going to sing the song, Father Abraham, right? That's what he's talking about. But verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. I'll stop it there. So many people, I believe, are still trying to live under a form of the law. Give me the rules and I'll do my best to follow them. Listen, I commend your heart to follow God's rules. There is nothing wrong with that. To the extent that you understand that in no way makes you righteous.
Follow God's word because you love Jesus. Follow God's word because every time you open it, it breathes fresh life into you. Not because you think it's going to somehow justify you. Historically, we mark this year the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. But only the events that took place this week, really being kicked off with Palm Sunday, the events that took place this week, only those events in history, in my opinion, are worthy of an annual and even daily remembrance and celebration. Very thankful for the reformers. Very thankful for the difference it has made in the course and the direction of the modern church. But in my opinion, there's only the life the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that is worthy of an annual and, again, I'll say, daily remembrance and celebration. As our team right now prepares to serve us, deacons, members of our tech worship team, as you prepare now to serve us, go with me. By all means, don't leave. This is going to be really good. Go with me now. And let's turn our focus to the one who, by his work, offers us the justification by faith alone. Father, in Jesus' name, we come. And Lord, as we think about the final week, we love you. We seek to honor you, to glorify you. God, help us to reflect on what you've done and to say thank you with all that we are in Christ's name. Amen.